Hello everyone, welcome to the ATAR Notes April Lecture Series as well as our lecture for English Units 3 and 4. My name is Sunny, I'm really excited to be delivering this lecture for you all today and I hope that you find it super helpful. Looking forward to the future areas of study that you're going to be doing as well as towards the exam. Um, on this slide you can just see some of the resources that ATAR Notes has to offer as well. If you need some additional help with your studies, it's really, really helpful. So feel free to have a look and let's jump right into the lecture. So first of all, I'll begin by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Sunny, as I mentioned. I completed BC in 2021 with an ATAR of 96.70. Um, I received a study score of 44 in English, and I also did three English subjects. So I also did literature and English language on top of BC English. And I did well in all of those subjects as well. I'm currently in my last year of uh, completing a Bachelor of Paramedicine degree at Monash University. Let's jump right into it. So follow along on the bottom bar. Um, we'll go through some basic things that are important for English in the beginning, and then we'll do specific areas of study. So we'll look at text response, the creating text area of study that's new on the study design, as well as analyzing argument and finish off with some final tips and tricks and advice. Um, it's also a really, really big lecture. So you might have seen if you've opened up the slides in the resources that um, we've got a lot to run through, so the pace that we're going at will be very long, very quick as well. So ask a lot of questions, use the live chat to ask questions, questions as we're going through. Feel free to pause on some of the slides and have a bit of a closer look as well. Um, but we do have a lot to get through today. So first disclaimer, it's not too late to start being good at English. You've still got plenty of time in the year. You know that an English subject has to be in your top four when determining your ATAR. Um, and so English is an important subject to focus on because if you don't do well, it still has to be in your top four subjects that, you know, they contribute 90% to your study score, their, their study score. So try to put in a lot of work and make it count and make good use of today's um, presentation as well. <clears throat> So the first thing we have a chat about is the importance of meta language in BC English. So you need to make sure you've got a lot of like authorial intent verbs under your belt. Um, you're naming um, your techniques accurately, your structural features in your text. So some vocab lists that I recommend making, think about it in terms of word class. You need a lot of verbs to describe what the author is doing. So collect more authorial purpose verbs and really build your list of those. This is an easy way to improve your vocab immensely if you're someone that struggles with enhancing your vocab. Um, look for tone words. You'll need that for argument analysis. So expand, make a list of those as well. Come up with, have a lot of adjectives to describe language being used and to depict um, connotations and feelings associated and effects created by imagery in your text um, and the nouns. So to actually help name your techniques, which is an expectation. If something is a simile, if something is a metaphor, um, <clears throat> if something is a film technique, you know, you need your film technique vocab if you're doing a film and you need to be really confident and adept in using that as well. So that's a key skill to focus on. Now, evidence and analysis, also an important skill, must be intertwined. Never have evidence without analyzing it. And you should never really have standalone sentences that just have a quote there and aren't already giving some kind of point to the quote. Yeah, you can analyze in more than one sentence, but you should already be saying some kind of idea in the sentence that your quote or your evidence is embedded within. You know, you should al al already have analysis in that sentence or an explanation of that quote at the very minimum in that sentence to embed your quotes nicely. Never have discussion without supporting it with evidence and using plot elements. Plot retail is not evidence. Quotes and structural features in your text. 
and aim to have a lot of structural features to analyze in every single essay. Um, avoid summary by using nominalization. This is when you convert your verbs into nouns to make them sound fancy, but it also helps you, forces you to analyze. So let's have a look at an example. The playwright depicts Bob walking down the street through the movement of his feet, one in front of the other. That's our evidence. There's no analysis there. What if we use nominalization and we turn depict into depiction? The playwright's depiction of Bob walking down the street through the movement of his feet, one in front of the other. Now, this has forced us to analyze because unlike the first example, we can't end the sentence there. It's unfinished because we had depiction. We turned it, turned that authorial purpose verb into a noun and now we have to say something else so we maybe extend saying that this implies that and then actually put some kind of idea there on the page so that helps to make sure your evidence and analysis are intertwined you don't have just evidence without analysis in a sentence you know also showing poor Im embedding of quotes just a few more examples in that little table so why is nominalization good? It forces you to analyze, like we've talked about. Here's another example. The character experiences a plethora of emotions as she walks down the neighborhood she grew up in. That's just plot retail, no analysis. But if we have the character's experience of a plethora of emotions, again, we've nominalized, we have it turned into a noun. As she walks down the neighborhood, forces us to say something more before we end the sentence reflects the conflicting events of her childhood. And so we've ended with an idea. <clears throat> a little bit of a starter list of intent verbs. And we have show crossed out because you should never be using show. This is the worst, most basic and least specific word. These are just your replacements for the word show. Okay, so never use show use something much more specific. And here's a little bit of a list to start with that you can add. Similarly, make and says are another two intent verbs that are, they're not even really intent verbs that we don't want to see. Show, make and says. Find substitutes, lots of substitutes for all of these in the subject. <clears throat> now modality. This is more so on the topic of argument analysis. Um, so modal verbs, express a degree of certainty about something. So high modality would be showing a high degree of certainty and low modality would be showing a low degree of certainty. So your job as a student that has to write essays is to not use high modality language because this demonstrates fence sitting. The fact that you've got like really, you're really opinionated. So if you're writing an analyzing argument essay, and oh, you're saying, oh, the fact that the author uses this persuasive language technique must mean that, well, now you're fence sitting. You're assuming you know exactly what the author was trying to do. In English, just like how you're expected to write in a formal, informal register, not informal language in your essays, part of the expectation is that you don't sound definitive when you're discussing author's ideas or what they were trying to do, or what their intended effect on the audience was. So stick to low modality. This may indicate that the author believes blah, blah, blah. This could mean that blah, blah, blah. Not must, shall, you know, just abstain from that language. So <clears throat> I see a lot of students do without uh, even noticing. And importantly, planning. Must plan for your essays. And do a lot of practice planning for different prompts, especially for section A, because by the time of the exam, you only have one hour per essay to write, and you need to be very quick at planning. You should be able to jot down your ideas for each topic sentence and your contention, and your and maybe just think about your evidence in your head, and a plan should be done within a, a few minutes, three to five minutes max, so you can start writing. This is the efficiency that we need to get to while making sure, you know, our arguments are still very, very strong ideas and we don't misinterpret the prompt and through our arguments and our contention, we fully resolve the prompt. As a key area of weakness that Vika points out every single year is students not fully addressing the prompts, i.e. 
not having a counter argument to their essay, not treating a structural prompt like a structural prompt, um, conflating two synonyms together that have been put side by side and treating them as one word, even though you should have had separate arguments about them. If you see two words side by side, even if they sound similar, you need to figure out what is the difference in their meaning and be able to treat them as separate arguments and ideas. So planning helps to address all of that. In the beginning, do detailed plans, like this example. This is a really nice example, but it's a very detailed example. You won't have time to plan like this on, on the exam, working with those time limits. But while you're trying to get good at planning, you can even do these detailed plans and even like for your evidence, jot down your analytical idea, how you would analyze it in the body paragraph. It's a very valuable uh, revision task as well. Okay, so that's all for the little key skills um, that we're covering in the beginning. Now let's jump into text response. So if you were part of the January lecture, we cover text response in a lot more detail. <clears throat> this time around, because we did that, there will be more of a focus on creating text and analyzing arguments. So this section isn't as long and you should have uh, had your stacks pretty recently for text response as well. So less, less detailed of a revision this time around. We'll still cover all the things like essay structure, how to do the tags and some basic techniques and important ideas about analytical writing. <clears throat> so your text response is an analytical essay based on a set text. You are all doing with the new study design, you do two text responses now. So that means you have two texts to choose from. You need to choose one text that you want to focus on as your text response essay for the exam. <clears throat> okay. Don't try to be great at both texts so you can choose which text to do on the exam day. Focus on one text. And I recommend focus on the text you did first. If you just did text response area of study now in first term, it makes the most sense to focus on that text because, you know, you will have worked with it for the longest time and keep trying to expand and get better at writing analytical essays on it. But that's just my advice. So for each text, you get two prompts and you need to choose one. One will be a broad prompt. It will state a message about views and values or a, a theme. It will be a thematic prompt or a views and values based prompt. And one, the other one will typically be a narrow prompt. Um, usually a structural prompt. We know that if we choose a structural prompt, you know, ones that start with how, then the expectation is the essay cover should cover a lot of structural features, a lot, much more than in a typical essay. So you might have entire par an entire paragraph on a structural feature like setting alone. So be careful, make sure you don't choose prompts that you struggle to work with. Because if you don't fully address a prompt, your essay is holistically marked. So you're immediately plummeting to the lower range, even if the essay itself was pretty good, like it had the strong ideas, but you didn't address the prompt properly. So you can only get b between the lower and the medium range of marks now. Be really careful. Um, and they try to get students every year with the structural prompts that they'll put down because they'll they'll read like quite nicely. They'll give you a quote usually, and then they'll have how, indicating it's a structural features prompt, and then some kind of like nice statement, maybe like a statement about views and values. That for students, when they read that statement, they think, oh, it's easy, I can write an essay about this. But then they don't address that it's a structural prompt. They just write like a normal essay with normal arguments and normal evidence, a, a large amount of quotes, generally, um, just be careful with that. Um, your first priority is to be relevant. Be really smart about the evidence that you choose to use. Make sure it's not the basic quotes that anyone doing your text would be using and like a lack of structural features there. Um, make sure that you've got really strong analytical ideas and particularly really strong authorial intent messages and lots of them. You should have authorial intent statements at the end of all of your paragraphs, so your intro, each body paragraph and your conclusion, but to stand out and really get the marks for addressing the author's views and values, aim for at least twice per body paragraph. <clears throat> so if you look into something called the sub-argument method, 
for text response body paragraphs, you'd have a these and values message down the middle and then in your concluding sentence at the end of the body paragraph. <clears throat> we'll have a look at that in a bit more detail in a sec. Um, and use evidence from the whole text. That's another thing. This is the text response criteria. I feel like I've kind of talked through it by talking some of the things you need to be thinking about. Feel free to have a bit more of a read, but we've already talked about the strength of analysis, strength of evidence, very important. A bulk of the mark lies in authorial intent analysis, having a lot of it and having really, really strong statements around it, okay? And then your actual writing as well, how you structure it. By the end of the year, and this is the feedback on the examiner's report, they'll say that most students structured their response as well and their language was pretty good. So you need to get to that standard if you want to do well in English. And if you want to do well in English, you, should, you need to go above that standard. So make those vocab lists. Read exemplar essays from examiner's reports. Try to see how you can write more like them. Collect words that you like and put them in your essays. Work on sentence structure uh, and vari variation, variations in your sentence structure. So these are the four types of prompts. I've already mentioned it, character-based. Vika has said that you won't have character-based prompts on the exam, like they've taken it out. But I've noticed from students in my group class and students in my like private tutoring uh, as well that students are still getting character-based prompts for their school sacks and doing them in school. So I thought I would still keep it on the lesson um, because apparently a lot of you are still doing it. So they'll mention characters' names or the characters. But we can't have characters, uh, character-based topic sentences or arguments. Topic sentences need to be about ideas. So even if you have a specific character in mind, when you're writing a topic sentence, you need to take out the character name and write about, oh, you know, the author exposes how individuals or characters and put your ideas as a broad statement. Very important, even for your character-based prompts unless they mention just one character name in the prompt, maybe you can get away with it. Otherwise, never ever have character-based topic sentences and never discuss one character for an entire body paragraph, okay? Minimum is at least two. Um, also, these and values uh, prompts, they usually mention the author or the author's last name or the audience, and they provide some kind of moral to the story or the author's authorial intent idea that you can argue with. Thematic prompts, most common. Just like views and values, I feel like thematic and views and values are the nicest prompts to write in response to. They give you ideas that are easy to argue with, um, easy to come up with a counter argument as well. And they're usually quite broad and it's nice to write in response to them. It's easy to plop a lot of authorial intent discussion in, do a lot of extended analysis every once in a while. These are the prompts that I left writing in response to. Now, structural prompts start with how, maybe about the author creating meaning. So they can look a bit like a views and values prompt that start with how, but still the expectation is that you focus on techniques within your text, okay? So typically a student will do things like, they chose a structural prompt, they've got a paragraph on the setting, They've got a paragraph about imagery in their text. They've got a paragraph about um, symbolism in their text. Or if they're working with a film, yeah, they'll have like similar, they'll have like setting, you know, um, symbolism and an entire paragraph dedicated to film techniques. So for example, you're doing Sunset Boulevard and you've got an entire paragraph about film noir, film techniques, the genre. So like shadows, lighting, etc., gloomy settings in a body paragraph. So be conscious of structural prompts being a bit of a challenge if you're doing them correctly. Um, and you need to do them correctly on the exam, but it's really good to practice with. Might seem intimidating at first, but it's a really good way to help you learn to incorporate more structural features in any essay, because that should be a goal. Every paragraph should have at least a couple of structural features for balance. Um, for a strong essay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Unpacking prompts. How do you plan for a prompt? First of all, when you read a prompt, which category does it belong to? 
if it's worded a bit confusingly, literally reword it for yourself. Put synonyms, change words around, or rewrite it in a way that makes sense, just to make sure you're addressing it correctly. Highlight the key words in the prompt <clears throat> that must be addressed through your arguments. If any of the keywords are missed, you haven't resolved the prompt, we said why that's bad. Um, and then raise questions from your prompt to come up with your strongest arguments. So from your questions should come the ideas for your arguments. And you can follow a bit of a formulaic approach like this to coming up with your topic sentences. I like the first one in particular. So this one is the one that we'll focus on. This is generally a formula you can always use for structuring your essays. So let's say the prompt mentions an idea like <clears throat> relationships, right? My first topic sentence will always be about how the idea in my prompt is depicted and seen in the text. So I will essentially be defining the keyword in the prompt and providing examples for them. So my first topic sentence will be a statement about how are relationships seen in the text or portrayed in the text. And I'll give examples of different relationships and analyze them. That's my first, most, most simple argument, but I need to address my keyword, okay? Second argument will be either about exploring the causes for the prompt statement or the consequences. Why am I saying it's either or? Because we still need a counter argument for our third topic sentence. So you can choose between these two. Okay. If I said relationships are like really disingenuous in my topic sentence one for how relationships are portrayed, I might explore why our relationship disingenuine. Is it something about that zeitgeist, like the mood prevalent in that so the society of the text? And is it <clears throat> that people are really cold and like, you know, is it a post-World War II setting? Is it, um, you know, um, like cutthroat industry? You know, you could explore the causes as an argument or the consequences. If relationships <clears throat> are fake, in my text what is that what why is that important that will be what my argument is about does it make people feel isolated and lonely does it cause does it impact characters mental health you know you'll craft a topic sentence around the consequences implications um and then your last argument should be a counter argument you raise uh, although the prompt says this, that's wrong. Basically, you need to come up with a counter argument that can be raised from any of the keywords in your prompt. You can get quite creative with your counter arguments. So we see an example here. We're just using Harry Potter as a basic example. First topic sentence would be defining friendship and magic. Where do we see them in the text? Giving different examples. What kind of examples of friendship and magic are there? And <clears throat> If we want to go into causes, we talk about what causes friendship or what causes magic or both. And if we went into consequences, we'd be discussing what are the consequences of friendship, what are the consequences of magic. Just seeing it in action. I feel like I explained it a little bit better than the way it's laid out on the slide. All right, now importantly, essay structure. For your introductions, you should be starting with a context sentence, and this should introduce your text. So the first half of your context sentence will say the author's full name, the title of your text, the text type and the genre. And then the second half of your topic of your context sentence should be connecting to the prompt in a very broad way. So something that often helps students is using something like explores. So you state the textual detail, explores whatever my prompt is about, but you need to make sure you're not rewording any of the prompt words so think of it in a broad way okay so let's see with this example mary shelley challenges the bounds of reverie in her novel frankenstein as she describes frankenstein as a hideous progeny in the text preface signaling the significance of creation in the novel <clears throat> so this prompt would have been um about <clears throat> the idea of man versus nature and how humans like this pose destruction to nature. But you see this this broad statement isn't isn't rewording that or isn't saying that. <clears throat> Instead it's using 
this character that's basically a, an abomination to talk about the fact that human technological and uh, advancement and creation is really significant. So see how it should be nice and broad. It shouldn't be giving an opinion. It shouldn't be rephrasing the prompt. Find a way to lead into it. Usually you can make that second half of the context sentence. Just think, think along the lines of what the text is about with regards to the prompt that I've been giving. That's what your statement should be about. What is the text about in relation to my prompt? Um, and then you'll have your contention. Your contention should include your arg uh, your main argument, your main point of view. Do you choose to agree more with the prompt or disagree more with the prompt? And your counter argument. Now, the summary of your topic sentences is the part that I don't like. I think this students really struggle not to repeat their topic sentences twice in their intro and in their topic sentences and i think it's much more beneficial to do a detailed contention that clearly in envelops all of your arguments because a contention should already say your main argument and your counter argument right so why not do a detailed contention a couple of sentences give your main argument and your counter argument shed some more light on your main argument you know what your two topic sentences are about in that way, you're fulfilling what a signpost of your topic sentences would be doing anyway. So I think that makes your writing a lot, lot nicer. And then, as with every paragraph, we need to end with a views and values or authorial intent statement. Feel free to signpost in your intros. I feel like a lot of students' intros would read nicer. They just had a bit more signposting and just help with the flow. <clears throat> Body paragraphs. Obviously, your topic sentence should be your beginning. And then we're talking about the sub-argument method. So split your body paragraph into two halves to add a level of complexity and help with structuring essay. So <clears throat> have double-sided sentences. If we're talking about the example of um, what did we use? We use like love as an example. You said you had an essay a prompt about uh, relationships, sorry. And how can you make a double-sided sen topic sentence? Well, we said our first argument is going to talk about how is relationships depicted or seen in the text, okay? So a double-sided sentence would, wouldn't stop at saying relationships are portrayed as superficial. It would add a second thing that we can discuss in the within the body paragraph and be more complex. Let's say superficial and fleeting. They don't last, okay? So then you've got two sub arguments. The first thing that you'll establish, the first half of your body paragraph, which might be two free pieces of evidence and analyzing them, will be talking about how relationships are superficial. <clears throat> They're not genuine in your text. Once you're done, at the end of this sub argument, when you've done those two free pieces of evidence, state um, a views and values idea. This is how you can help yourself have more authorial intent. And that views and values would be all about how relationships are superficial. Then, and you might use a little bit of a signpost sentence to lead into the idea of, oh, but the relationships also don't last, they're fleeting. Or you can go straight into evidence and analysis again. And your second sub argument is going to be about how relationships are fleeting. They don't last. Same kind of thing. You'll choose two to three pieces of evidence. You'll analyze and end with views and values. But this time, you'll need a concluding sentence, right? So we know your views and value statement at the end of a body paragraph must link to your topic sentence. So it should be directly related to what the topic sentence was about. It should be an authorial intent idea about in relation to the topic sentence. So similarly, avoid mentioning characters in your authorial intent statements. Try to make them nice and broad. Even if you think about a specific character when you write them, I've got a few good examples here, at least in the last half of the sentence, because if it's in the last half of a the sentence, then it's not a message about society or views and values. So this is fine. The warmth and compassion of women is reflected in the creature. That's a character. But note how it doesn't use a character name. It makes it broaden out in the second half of the sentence. As Shelley suggests that when unsullied by men, humans are intrinsically compassionate and altruistic, the best qualities of mankind. <clears throat> so 
So it doesn't end on talking about the creature. It expands it to humans, um, even if the creature was in mind. Okay. <clears throat> now, conclusion. Your first sentence should be a summary of your contention, but you should have more to say about your essay since you've been writing you know you put this large amount of volume of writing on on page you should have more to say than you did in your contention in fact you really want to be using different words and you really want a couple of sentences summarizing your contention and your topic so cover the introduction literally don't look at the introduction because if you do you'll be one of those students that gets stuck or stuck on thinking how can i rephrase this and you won't end up writing anything new or anything of substance okay so then yeah you spend a couple sentences summarizing your topic and your contention use a signpost like overall or ultimately to start as well and you need to end with views and values you guessed it so that's it your most students conclusions are you know maybe about like 60 words or something like that nice and short <clears throat> now you need to end on as impactful of an authorial intent message as you possibly can because this is your conclusion. This is the last thing that the assessor is going to read. And it can be from anything in your text because you're not restricted to writing about the argument of a body paragraph, what that body paragraph is about. It's about your whole text now, okay? So these are some question prompts to help you come up with something different to say, something stronger to say. I like to think of it in the sense of, if you're running out of ideas, think for your final message, for your mic drop moment, what is the author trying to teach? Um, and that can help you come up with something cool to say. <clears throat> so we know with the contention that goes in your intro, your overall argument and response to the prompt, I mentioned this as well, it needs to incorporate all of your sub arguments. So go for a detailed contention, like try that to avoid having writing down all of your topic sentences in your intro, it will make your intros much shorter as well. So you can just get to the point with your body paragraphs because that's the actual important part. It's not like an intro is super important part of your writing. Um, it's where you're introducing your topic and your contention and that's the key things that you need to do. So it should incorporate your main arguments and your counter argument as well. Okay. <clears throat> Some essay things, never just restate the prompt in your own words, never fully agree or disagree with the prompt. I feel like I have addressed these as well, so just repeating, very important. Always have one paragraph that explores counter argument, use signposting. And for your contention, use those like however whilst to introduce your counter argument within your contention statement. So here are some contention examples. Skrinetsky's poetry suggests that memory is as much a source of pleasure as of pain. Discuss. Breaking down the prompt, what do we need to address? Memory. How is memory depicted? That's going to be our first topic sentence. How is it seen in the text? Is it a source of pleasure or is this a source of pain? We need to choose one. If we think it's more of a source of pleasure, that's what our second paragraph has to be about. And then for our counter argument, we'll have to dissect how it's also a sort of pain. If we want to do the other way around, pain will be our second argument and pleasure will be our counter argument in our third paragraph. Nice and easy. You can see like if you do it systematically, it's so simple to come up with like your topic sentences. So a contention statement, nicely signposted as well. <coughs> Whilst old new world suggests that memory brings individuals both pleasure and pain, Skrinetsky ultimately posits that such sen sensations are essential to the shaping of one's character. So this is indicating that the counter argument is that, yeah, this is a lot of emotion, but this is important to personal growth. Um, and the first half of the statement is saying, I mostly agree, it is both pleasure and pain. Okay. Another example, the world of Shelley's novel is characterized by injustice and ingratitude. To what extent do you agree? While Shelley portrays a society plagued by prejudice and thus injustice, again, first half we're saying we <clears throat> mostly, you know, mostly agree. She also ruminates on the value of pure pursuits, such as poetic justice and thankfulness within individuals detached from society. That's saying there is something else other than injustice and ingratitude as the counter argument. 
Um, there are pure pursuits within society, such as poetic justice, as a counter argument. So we see contention is including all of the arguments. And if you do a detailed contention, it won't just be like indicating you mostly agree and here is a counter argument, like these statements are, but your contention will actually aim to like kind of say like your main arguments as well, if you do the detailed contention that I've suggested, in a way, kind of signposting your topic sentences, but, you know, in a very short sense, you won't like detail them like you do in your when you state your topic sentences in your intro and you summarize all your topic sentences you just like kind of plop your reasons in there <clears throat> plop your arguments in there <clears throat> which also helps with <clears throat> not repeating the wording not getting stuck on like how to rephrase so we said topic and concluding sentences need to be connected <clears throat> this really helps to see 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 what it looks like your topic sentence is saying this is a key idea and your you, all of your evidence and analysis has to be about that idea you can't go off track and start talking about not exactly what your topic sentence is about that's a big problem as well then you get to the end you get to your concluding sentence and the concluding sentence has to be this is what the author says about this key idea really nice and simple so your final authorial intent statement cannot be just about what you were analyzing last. I see some students doing this. If you want, you can have two authorial intent statements. If you want, you can give a statement about the last thing that you were analyzing in the body paragraph. This is what the author says about this evidence. And you still need a concluding sentence following that. This is what the author says about the key idea in my topic sentence. So you can have two authorial intent statements or you just have to make sure your concluding sentence is related to your topic sentence. You should be reading the topic sentence as you try to formulate and write your concluding sentence or for your intent statement. So we see this example uh, filled with innuendo, Don's aud audacious carnal love poetry openly focuses on the fleeting joy of physical desire and the struggle to attain it as a topic sentence. When we finally get to the concluding sentence, therefore, signposting, Don explores the fleeting joy of erotic desire but maintains that there is a genuine struggle to maintain a relationship funded solely on physical attraction so the topic sentence was about carnal love like that erotic love right and physical desire we see this is the key idea this is how love is depicted by don that's what the topic sentence is saying concluding sentence says about this idea of physical desire and erotic love the author says that this is unrealistic. It will be difficult to maintain a genuine relationship. So we see that connection nice and clear. <clears throat> Bit more notes on body paragraphs. You need to make sure you outline a clear focus in your topic sentence. Follow that sub argument method. Like if you want, go back on the video a bit and watch my explanation about it again. It's a really good method for anyone that struggles with structure, including an author or foreal intent. And it helps to make sure that you don't just have one idea in a body paragraph, you have two. So write those little double-sided topic sentences, you know? <clears throat> Instead of using one adjective, this is how the author portrays relationships, use two. Um, get, give yourself that opportunity not to limit yourself to one type of discussion point, but at least two. So a clear focus should be outlined in your topic sentence. Um, <clears throat> they assessors should be able to read your essay and follow along with what you're trying to communicate and there should be no confusion about your arguments include good evidence to justify your sub arguments and make sure you avoid plot retelling okay write as though you are explaining yourself to someone who knows the text well so when you're including a quote we don't need to know what happened before during and after that quote unless that's going to be part of your analysis and a plot element without any structural feature or quote in conjunction with it is not evidence that you can analyze. Quotes and structural features and genre specific features to your text are evidence. Textual details should be extremely minimal, with the exception of like you're writing something like film technique and the actual element of what's happening adds to your analytical idea in some way. 
if you're breaking down a quote but still even if some of that plot element is relevant you should be so succinct and to the point when you explain what's happening in the plot if you're if you've got an entire line about what's happening in the plot that's already too much because you were planning to like analyze it in conjunction with other evidence that's already too much few words minimal um so understand that all of your assessors they know your text perfectly they don't need context for where your quotes and your evidence are coming from um use quotes and integrate them within your discussion work on integrating quotes at this stage of the year uh of you know you're in year 12 don't want to see students not making use of square brackets and ellipses to make their quotes modify and fit into sentences nicely um and we definitely don't want to see remember from the beginning like standalone a sentence that introduces evidence in a quote and doesn't analyze in the same sentence or doesn't start to analyze and explain in the same sentence and extend that into an, another one following that um use varying quote lengths keep your quotes short you know hopefully most of your quotes can be two to five words conflate put quotes together like put a couple of pieces of evidence together such as a film technique with a quote or two quotes analyze them together at once that can be a way to increase how much evidence you're using as well and show off a bit that you can structure and embed quotes nicely and lots of authorial intent analysis very very important already talked about it with your conclusions <clears throat> you're aiming to consolidate your arguments rather than summarizing them you are not restating your contention you are adding to your contention based on everything you've written thus far in this entire essay um <clears throat> link to the text as a whole into the broader societal concern for that final view and value statement think what is the author trying to teach what is their final message in regards to my prompt um this point about bringing up new evidence in your intros and in your conclusions you can have stylistic quotes these might be just descriptive one to two word quotes such as like adjectives and things like that otherwise there should never be evidence even if you get a prompt that has a quote in it yes you have to address the quote because it's been given to you with the prompt you must analyze it in a body paragraph though you have to craft an argument that fits the quote that's popped up within the prompt for you it does not go in your intro it does not go in your conclusion no evidence in intro or conclusion well-placed stylistic quotes are great you can even put a stylistic quote like yeah it's usually some kind of like descriptive language in a topic sentence and that's fine um but you need to use them you know strategically you don't want to have like heaps of them every once in a while in an essay you might do something like that this is just another little tip it's it's a bit of a vocab enhancer as well just finding like one to two word quotes in your text that you're using as stylistic quotes <clears throat> oftentimes students do it with like ways that characters are referred to by other characters or how someone's described um <clears throat> now your elements of text response this is basically just a little pyramid that shows how to get good marks now you need a structural devices so this bottom of the pyramid is the majority of your essay the majority of your essay is of course evidence okay so that should be your quotes and your structural features within your text <clears throat> for a high score i would say aim for a 50 50 balance between quotes and using structural features that's a good tip so if you're studying a film you'd be doing 50 trying to do 50 percent film techniques as evidence and analysis 50 percent quotes really good balance to aim for <laughs> now it's on the bottom because your evidence is the majority of your essay and then the rest is what you are analyzing in terms of so a vast majority of students analysis will tend to bring things back to characters every still frequently you should relate your analysis to themes and what you'll be doing less often is the views and values or authorial intent analysis you know when you analyze one step further and you give an authorial intent statement but this is really really important we said this is where the bulk of the marks is so try to do it frequently um just an example of analyzing views and values in a bit more detail say we're working with a metaphor 
So then we still need to analyze because this is within a body paragraph. We still need to talk about what the metaphor represents and then we can connect to authorial intent. What is the author's message in utilizing that metaphor to represent an idea? So let's have a look at an example. <clears throat> in the film Rear Window, there's physical and symbolic boundaries. When characters leave their apartments and enter public spaces, they're confronted with danger. So our analysis of that is that it creates unease when characters cross physical boundaries. And then our foil intent statement that we can give after we've analyzed, Hitchcock suggests the impossibility of regulating one's boundaries or that the blurring of one's ethical and physical boundaries are inevitable. So you can see that when you want to extend views and values within a body paragraph, first of all, make sure you've got a significant enough idea. The evidence is significant enough to do that. You still need to introduce the evidence and analyze it first, and you can extend into an additional sentence, additional idea where you discuss a foreal intent. <clears throat> a little note about characters, using correct language when you talk about characters. Characters are a construct of the author. They are not living entities. So don't talk about them as if they are carrying out actions. Always use your like authorial intent verbs when you're talking about a character. For example, the author depicts or presents the character's name as doing an action in order to whatever your analysis is. Okay, so a couple of examples of the appropriate language. We never want to to see like, ah, uh, you know, the the character is sad. The character, um. <clears throat> does this no the character is depicted is presented as make sure you're using language that clearly indicates that you're aware that the character is a construct of the author and for structural features if you haven't already for your text response text make huge banks huge notes of the structural features within your text very very important um that's an easy way to enhance your marks by enhancing the evidence that you're using and use text specific structural devices it's just a little list here if you're doing a play there you'll have some unique um structural features if you're doing a film you will also have some unique structural features so look for those i won't read this whole slide it's just giving some examples of nice um structural devices and also so feel free to pause and have a look note that there's meta language being used, and that's been highlighted as well. Um, whenever you're analyzing structural features, you need to make sure you name them, you identify them correctly. For example, rhyme, metaphors, it's been named and connected to analysis in quite a succinct way. This looks like an extract from a paragraph written on a structural prompt. Now, to avoid summary, <clears throat> we talked about nominalization okay but let's just chat about the difference because a lot of students struggle they'll go into plot retail when they're trying to analyze evidence and won't be able to tell the difference what ask yourself what are you actually doing if you come across this problem because to summarize means to rephrase evidence from the text in your own words to analyze means to answer the question why is this important why is this evidence significant so you need to think of beyond just explaining what the quote is saying in different words and not explaining why it is important. So for example, this, though Juliet beseeches Romeo to be some other name, he's reluctant to abandon the reputable name of Montague. We don't care that he's reluctant to abandon his reputable family name because we already know that this is a plot element. It's not analysis. Even though there's been fluffy language here, this statement has no value in an essay. Now analysis, Juliet reveals she's willing to no longer be a Capulet if Romeo will not deny his father and refuse his name, thus demonstrating that her strength and boldness surpasses his. So if we go back to the pyramid, it's doing a character analysis. There's another way you can check. Um, have I given a statement about why my evidence is significant in terms of characters? themes or views and values? If not, I have not analyzed. Or just simply asking yourself the question every single time you think you finish writing an analysis, have I answered why is this evidence important? How is it significant? Or did I plot retell? 
more examples here. Feel free to have a look. This one is annotated as well for, for the sake of timing. Oh, I don't know why I did that. Sorry, guys. For the sake of timing, I just want to move on. Um, now, notes about essays. Mid-range essays will do things like start a sentence with a quote rather than embedding it to flow within your sentence. Use those square brackets, use those ellipses. We'll use very long quotes without breaking them down. Might end a sentence with a quote and then move on to a different example or idea so they fail to analyze. Use quotes verbatim without any quote modification. That's also a skill to practice and helps with your essay flow significantly and your structure if, you're not, if you struggle with it still. State a quote that proves a point without explaining how. So always you need that link in your analysis. How is this quote significant? To then show how it creates the effect that you're trying to outline. Um, <clears throat> only including three quotes per paragraph, like a low number of quotes, I'd say aim for five pieces of evidence in a paragraph, definitely four at minimum, but I'd aim for five, six. How can you have more? Do what I said, like combine evidence together. If you've got a film technique, combine it with a quote and analyze it together or like a symbol or, you know, put two quotes together and analyze both of them at once. So they're not wrong, but they're typical of mid-range pieces. And what high-range essays will do, they'll aim, they'll give themselves a word limit for their quotes, short quotes, one to seven words, for precision analysis, because you don't need the whole quote, you just need the part that you're specifically going to analyze. So most of your quotes can be less than five words pretty easily. Um, they paraphrase parts of the text and only quote the most relevant language. Integrate quotes and analysis in the same sentence. They'll never leave a crucial quote unanalyzed. They'll have a mix of blended and analyzed quotes. So meaning quotes that are just nicely blended and flowing within my sentences and quotes that are being analyzed in the same sentence to help vary with the sentence structure. So my essay doesn't get boring. Um, use square brackets and ellipses to modify we see an example here you use square brackets when you want to change the grammar of a quote but you cannot change the actual meaning so we can say instead of i we could change it to she wanted to go home to make it flow within our sentence too and we just put square brackets around she to indicate we turned it from i to she um and ellipses help you to skip a part of the quote we don't care about leave so we put ellipses and just go home. It's just an easy example. <clears throat> and they'll pull from a variety of different characters and moments across the text. They'll go out of their way to look for evidence for minor characters, structural features, quotes they didn't think they wouldn't think students would commonly know or use in their essays to stand out. And discuss and analyze quotes alongside structural features, underlined because very important. Okay, good. So now we're moving into our next section, crafting text. So this is the new area of study that was um, added on to the study design. And again, if you were here for the January lecture that I did, we looked at it in a much more broad sense. So the January lecture was all about writing techniques and how to actually engage in creative writing. So we won't have a repeat of the same thing for that reason that we already covered it. So we looked at creating texts in a broad way today and some things like the reflective commentary, breaking down audience purpose and context and the actual task. And you can also register for the crafting text um, specific sessions for each framework that HR Notes is doing as well. Um, so there's a one hour session specifically for each framework and it covers the things like the mentor text as well. So I really recommend that. Um, so this new area of study means that you have two assessments. You will write two written texts constructed in consideration of audience purpose and context. And that's specifically pointed out. You must have planned audience purpose and context. And you also have to write a reflective commentary. So in this area of study, it's all about <clears throat> producing your own text with audience purpose and context in mind and in response to a specific framework having a message in relation to your framework. We'll also have a look at an example of this. So a bit more of a breakdown of the task and 
what's what's it trying to get you to do is trying to develop your creative and imaginative capacity as a writer um the reason you've got mentor text that each of you are doing free as part of your framework they want you to be able to read and engage critically with them and use them as a model to develop your own pieces of writing so it's actually the aim is to for you to <clears throat> be inspired in some way by your mentor text and think about what aspects of them you might want to take on board and put in your own writing whether ideas based or textual features based aspects you'd like to incorporate so you engage in close reading helping to under develop an understanding of uh diverse ways that vocabulary text structures language features conventions of different text types and ideas can interweave to create compelling text you're also expected for this area of study to learn to write in different text types so you might write a persuasive speech one day then a feature article then a short story then a memoir and the expectation is that you become adept at writing in different text types and in order to do well on this task both on the exam and on your SATs, there's an expectation that you incorporate your own structural features and language techniques into your writing and that you also abide by genre conventions and show that you have an understanding of genre conventions through the way that you make your piece this is where you can experience the creative writing process you'll experience with adaptation individual creation and construct an original piece of writing um <clears throat> and um vika is encouraging you to use your own life experiences and things like people that you look up to to extend upon ideas and help in your writing and this is all yeah aiming to inspire students make you like enjoy creative writing and understand um how the process actually occurs um and be able to do it yourself <clears throat> so you write two creative pieces i recommend to students if you're a creative student you know you should always stick a main text type that you will always write in so you can practice it because this is going to be an exam task and you only have one hour at the end of the year so to write a creative in an hour is not easy like to write a good creative so work with a main text type if you're a creative imaginative student work with something like short story memoir if you're more of a technical student um if you don't like the creative writing stick to you know opinion piece persuasive articles speech that kind of text type because that that's where a more technical student could excel um writing in a more logical rather than a necessarily super creative kind of way so first identify what you are better at what's your preferred text type and hone that skill keep working on it students that are high scores will come into the exam with really broad ideas already of what they're going to write about they'll come in with a plan in their mind because if you had a look at the sample exam the tasks are so extremely broad the prompts are so extremely broad that you can easily come in with a planned out idea or even a piece of writing that you've already done at home or like in a sack like you can kind of remember you can come in with that and just slightly modify your piece based on what your prompt is exactly to make sure that your purpose audience context and especially the message of your piece now perfectly fit what prompt you took on the exam so that's important to know um it's too difficult to come in with nothing in your head so these are the key knowledge dot points as i mentioned dissecting mentor text purpose or context and audience writing in different modes um <clears throat> generating and developing original ideas your own creative writing and I've highlighted the important ones. <clears throat> so there are four frameworks av available and everyone is doing one. So there's protest, personal journeys, uh, country and play. Okay. These are the four frameworks that uh, everyone is writing about one of them and everyone's doing free mentor text. And there are four in total of the study design. So pretty much every student doing the same framework is pretty much studying the same short mentor text. Okay um you will study and closely analyze the mentor and supplementary text as well 
there's an expectation that your schools give you a bit of like additional text than the ones just on the study design. They pick some more that are about your framework in some way and you use ideas from them to develop your own personal ideas for creative writing. Then you develop your own creative piece and then you write a reflective commentary. This is like a mini analysis, almost like a mini argument analysis of your own writing written in first person, but in a formal style. And you need to dissect all of your authorial choices and your purpose, audience context, and what were you, um, what were some of the language features that you chose to put in your piece as well. It's a very short piece that you'll be writing and we cover it uh, in a little bit of detail today as well. Now, do you have to choose what if you don't like the framework that you're doing in school? You could technically do a different framework on the exam. Just make sure you're you're confident because I feel like you don't need a lot of background knowledge. Like if if you want to write, if you're doing country and you don't like it and you want to write about personal journeys, as long as you do a little bit of study about ideas, you can write about for personal journeys and a bit of practice. I feel like you could do it um, and it's fine. You wouldn't get in trouble either, but do know the benefit of working with the same framework in school or all year long and do you want to give that up so yeah weigh weigh that up um so these are the task requirements this is how you're marked this is the criteria did you develop meaningful ideas is there a really strong purpose message embedded within your piece um and is it consistent throughout like do you have a sustained purpose or message that's really clear from your piece in relation to your framework Creating a purposeful text for a specific context and audience. You need to make these as specific as possible, context and audience. Experiment with vocabulary and text structures. Actually don't be, actually go out of your way. Like if I'm writing an opinion piece, I'm gonna try to write it with a bunch of persuasive language techniques. If I'm writing a feature article, I've got like different subheadings and small little paragraphs in my piece. Um, <clears throat> So follow the conventions of your text type and put structural features in your pieces. Have a sustained individual voice. And we just talked through a couple of these. So the first one that said developing meaningful ideas, here's an example, how to do it and how not to do it basically. So your, your piece might only embed a simple idea. For example, protest is hard, country is important, Personal journeys are rewarding. Play is fun. That's bad because we don't see a meaningful idea. You need a complex idea embedded in your piece, com coming from your piece. So a complex idea. <clears throat> Why is protest hard? Well, because it involves clashes in ideologies and strongly held beliefs, meaning that for one side to succeed, another often has to fail. That's a ex good example of a complex idea. Country is important. Country is important because it is the foundation of our cultural identity and shapes our understanding of who we are and where we belong. Meaning that without a connection to country, we cannot forge a clear sense of self. You get the idea. Develop a <clears throat> meaningful, impactful message for your piece. And it should be identified from reading your piece, not only just from your reflective commentary. So practice embedding your message. How can we create a purposeful text as well? So your creative should have a clear and stated purpose. That's what I pointed out. And you need to choose from the four that Vika has given to express, to reflect, to explain, or to argue something, okay? Make sure you clearly choose one and it's clear from your piece that you cho chose one of these. When you decide to write a text, there should be a goal or aim in mind that you want to achieve through the text. And your purpose must align with the specific context of your creative framework and the audience that you're intending to target. Now, there's nothing wrong to, with choosing a modern context as well. You don't have to get historical with it. Um, but do think, do plan that out. What is the context you're going for? And make your audience as specific as possible. If you can't make it any more <clears throat> specific and you get a bit stuck with that, one way that it's it's a bit easier to make your confidence more, uh, audience more specific is to like choose an age group choose a very specific age group. I find that helps some students. It's just like a little bit 
or just outlining people that would be concerned with very specific things. Okay. <clears throat> this criteria can be achieved by effectively planning and refining your piece. So what I would do for planning personally is I would, you know, map everything out. You know, if I've got a prompt, my translation of what that prompt is, like obviously interpret what those vague words, what they mean to you and write that down first. You want your title, your purpose, your audience, context, text type, even things like register, what uh, person, first person, third person you're going to be writing in, your tone, if it's, if it's, if it's relevant. Um, and then for something like an opinion piece, do a dot point plan of what the, what the progression will be in your piece. So like, what do you want to put in your intro and then what kind of like arguments you're going to have and how they will progress. You can even plan every single paragraph if you wanted to. Um, for something like a short story, I would plan out my character profiles um, in a bit of detail and I would plan how the plot is going to progress. So, oh, I'm going to start a setting de description of blah, blah, blah. And it's going to, I'm going to try to portray it in this kind of way, like in a really gloomy kind of way, really, uh, you know, whatever you're going for. And then this is going to happen and this is going to happen. <clears throat> so do detailed plans because especially when you're starting out, that's going to really help with how you write. And you're not going to get stuck writing if you plan the whole thing out for yourself. You've laid it out. So dedicate time to detailed plans. <laughs> Vocabulary and text structures. So this criteria involves the selection of keywords and phrases to create a certain effect. You need to consider the audience that you are targeting. And based on the audience that you're targeting and the context, that needs to be consistent with your language and structural choices, okay? So that's why you need to plan that. <clears throat> Different audience will, would respond differently to certain text structures and language choices. Um, and you can even change big things like the register that you're going to use. Or it can be just small things like what type of features, structural features, would be more convincing to a certain audience that I'm aiming to affect, okay? <clears throat> Consider how your mentor and supplementary text positioned a similar audience. And if you go to some of these, um, a session on your framework as well, you'll see that we break down the audience context and purpose of every piece. And we talk about some of the language features that were used in the piece and how they create an effect upon the audience. So doing that analysis helps you to plan how you're going to do it. <clears throat> now, what are the four frameworks? Let's, let's talk about the frameworks that we've got. Writing about country, in a nutshell, is exploring place and belonging, and especially if you've got an experience like um, <clears throat> immigration, you can draw on. That can help to add like a really nice personal touch to writing about country. Um, and there's a lot of ideas you can take it. You can explore physical land and country, local and international, loss of country, dispossession, remembering country, nostalgia, migration, power of connections with land, climate change and modern issues, What's happening to the world currently? Changing landscape, natural disasters, imagined countries, uh, farming, land management, cultural expression. So you get the point. There are so many, so many different ideas. And this is a pretty exhaustive list to come up with more. Writing about protest. A bit more of a narrow topic than, than country. Um, exploring conflict and contest. What it means to protest, the value of protest, outcomes of protest, personal stories of protest, struggle and war. You can see it's got a bit of connections to country, but it's much more of a narrow topic. So think about historical elements for this. If you can find a historical element that you can really relate to. Personally, I couldn't, I don't see myself, like if I had this framework, I don't see myself being able to relate to like the old far in the past, like protests, but I would prefer to write about modern issues like climate change, government maybe even like an internal monologue about how i feel about the state of a current something and not an actual physical protest but like an internal protest would be something like i would do um so doing like individual protests internal protests uh writing a futuristic piece about how things are in the future and it's just like a really an extreme version of how you expect things to end up 
So do you can still do some interesting things with it. It doesn't have to be historical. If you don't like the idea of making it historical, if you do, that's great. You can think about modern issues, internal protest, things like that. <clears throat> some ideas. Writing about personal journeys. Again, migration is appropriate here. Movement and disruption. Any change you've experienced in your life. And it's all about telling our stories, telling other stories, Oof, stories, journeys. It can be physical adventure and it can be, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be um, just life experiences and changes and things like that. It can be those things like biography, autobiography, um, but it can also be um, <clears throat> uh, telling other people's stories and yeah, physical adventures, travel, you can pretty much do, you can do almost anything with this topic. It can even be an internal personal journey, like how you change as a person. Writing about play, <coughs> exploring experiences and traditions of play. Mostly, and especially with the sample exam, I saw that like all the prompts were pretty much about childhood play and imaginative play, which I know narrows it down. Um, but if you've got this framework, there's much more to it. You know, you can talk about games, sport competitive sport any form of arts dancing writing playing music um reading <clears throat> play with language if, if you've got the skill for it i know one of the mentor texts is about that as well it's quite interesting art <clears throat> rules and rule breaking there's much more ideas that you can use it for okay not just childhood play, although that's interesting as well. So we said how you get free mentor texts. Just a bit of a definition. I feel like we've gone over this already. Your mentor texts are intended to be starting points for the development of your personal ideas specific to the framework. They can act as prompts for your own creative writing. And they'll be in various forms. So they're also intended to inspire you for the different modes you can write in. And your supplementary texts are unassigned mentor texts. They're not on the study design additional text that your teachers are tasked to find and choose personally to supplement your learning and serve the same serve the same purpose as mentor checks now let's have a look at purpose audience and context so <clears throat> vika has said all writers need to consider for whom they are writing under what circumstances and for what purpose there's a very specific expectation that you clearly outline these and make them clear for your writing as well. Um, they're intended to form the foundation of any piece of writing. In the absence of this, these elements, the writing will not be effective or cohesive. So you have you must do your research and draft these before you start any writing. <clears throat> now, purpose. The purpose of the text is your message. It's the ultimate reason for why you've spent all this time to write your piece. So this is your message the what you want your readers your audience to gauge from your text to to learn from your text the idea you want to plant in their head and it must be connected to your framework let's use a mentor text as an example for pers this one's for personal journeys in the red plastic chairs of vietnamese cultural institution my anchor what a long title um, the author writes her short story to reflect on her relationship with Vietnamese cultural identity and to symbolize the importance of family. But what was her ultimate purpose? That's just what it is about, okay? That's not a purpose. What the text is about is not a purpose. That might be some links to personal journeys, but what is the message? Her ultimate purpose was to encourage young adults to contemplate the connections they have with their heritage and cultural traditions and to illustrate the enduring power of familial bonds to her audience. Now that's a person for purpose. And we see clear links to journeys. She managed to gain an appreciation of her heritage and her familial bonds and her dual cultural identity. And that was her personal journey, personal growth. Okay. Now to help you with purposes, Vika has given you these. I've put some nice definitions on the slide, but you're either aiming to express something through your piece, and here are some of the things that you can do if you're trying to explore feelings and thoughts, because that's what Express is going to be doing, exploring feelings and thoughts to explain something. <clears throat> that might be good for more technical writing, like if you're going to go for 
feature article, persuasive speech type stuff, um, more of a logical tone, to reflect, exploring past experiences, personal discovery, <clears throat> memories, flashbacks, arguing is giving a point of a specific point of view. Um, don't confuse explain with argue. Um, even explain, you could be explaining the reasons behind something. Cause and effect, think cause and effect. Arguing <coughs> is expressing that your opinion is right. Here's what, basically. Convincing others. Really, really associated with persuasive writing. Okay. Now, context. It can be social, historical, temporal, and or political environment in which your text is constructed. Okay, so you can go for anything. For example, for Shakespeare, is inspired by the views set against the backdrop of the Elizabethan era, <clears throat> which is significantly different from a modern context. Messages, views, and values are evident when an author is writing in a specific context. So if you're writing in a modern context, you need to reflect the concerns and views and values of someone living in a modern context, especially if you're taking on a persona when you write, you need to really get into that persona's mind. But if you're setting your text in the past, you need to clearly indicate that it's written by someone that lives in a different time, you know? So that's a bit of a skill to practice. Look at how your mentor texts have done this. And now audience, <clears throat> who are you targeting? Who are you writing your piece for? Um, as specific as possible, but you need to strike a balance. So you wouldn't want to be your audience overly specific or overly broad and vague. For example, general public of Australia. That's bad. That's very vague. And then very specific person that is concerned with the quality of this and uh, and this and that. No, not good enough. So um, it gets too specific there. So we'll have a look at some examples um, some examples of audience in the um, creating text framework specific sections because sessions because if you should register for those because um, we talk about what the audience is for each piece because you kind of need an example you need an example but if you want to make it the more specific the better um, now after you plan your purpose, context, and audience, the next thing that you need to do is the style of writing that you're going to choose. So there's generally three styles that you can write in. This is where you need to select what you're strongest in, what is your strengths, imaginative, informative, and persuasive. <clears throat> now, imaginative is suitable for someone that might like to imagine hypothetical scenarios, create stories, engage in short story writing, make stories in your mind, recount, reimagine details from your past, write things like a memoir, Focus on small details. Are you really good at detailing thoughts, feelings, description, setting? Um, are you able to adopt the voice of an another of another person and can convey things subtly through clever word choice? This is really for the creative writer, and the text types that you choose should be accord accordingly chosen. Informative? Do you like to research, compile information? This is good for your logical student more so than someone who feels confident in writing in a really creative way. Share your interests and passions, deep dive into a topic. So informative, you might do something like a stream of consciousness, an internal monologue, you know, a persuasive, it can be still like the style of persuasive pieces might be suitable for someone that likes writing in an informative style. Um, discuss ideas rather than express opinions. So this is the key thing that differentiates from persuasive. And this is why a student that lacks the informative style, but doesn't want to like giving a lot of information, but not expressing opinions. <clears throat> you don't like fence sitting. You don't like choosing a position. Yeah, this might be suitable for yeah someone who might write stream of consciousness, internal monologue, and some of the persuasive styles. Um, might write like a feature article. Now persuasive, this is your opinion pieces, blog posts, um, <clears throat> oral, you know, that that type of writing. It's kind of like argument analysis. That's why a lot of students can do quite well at it as well, because all this all students have to do analyzing argument and write orals and stuff. So 
everyone's got a bit of background and practice with persuasive writing. So this is more <clears throat> um, about arguing your point of view, coming up with strong arguments, expressing your opinion, advocating for what you believe in. Both of these are quite logical styles. So if you're a student that struggles with this imaginative aspect, don't box yourself in. Here are some suggestions and styles that you can practice writing in. Okay, lastly, we're having a chat about this reflective commentary. Um, <clears throat> the reflective commentary is a short piece of prose that explains various authorial decisions that you made throughout the creative text. There's no specific structure to it, and it's a short piece, but these are the things that you must include. Vocab choices, text structure, including what text type you've chosen and the genre convention, some of the language features, views and values, themes and big ideas. So in some way, shape or form, you need to make sure that you tick this off in a reflective commentary. It's just an analyzing argument of your own work. This is where you write to your teacher how you've been inspired by mentor and supplementary text, if you have, what your piece is about, what have you done with your piece, what were the intended effects you were aiming to create upon your audience for some of those language choices, what is your main message, your purpose in your piece, and how is that being created, and that's what you'll be dissecting. So a breakdown of what you should include. Have you made some significant vocabulary choices? Analyze it. Um, have you adopted anything from your mentor text intentionally? If you have, analyze it. That's all you're doing. You're raising things that you've done in first person, you do quote as well, and then you analyze why you've done it. Language features, any significant language features that you've incorporated. And you know, it's a sh this is a very short piece of writing, so you'll only choose a couple of maybe most significant language features that, or vocabulary choices that you've done. Language modes, did you, what, did, what particular text type did, did you choose? And if relevant, if there's a reason why, why did you target it? Why did you go for that text type? Can, <clears throat> Break down some of the plot structure, especially if you've done something like gone for a non-linear narrative. Is there things like flashbacks or back and forth, leaping back and forth? Narration voice, what kind of voice did you go for? Was it first person? Was it third person in your piece? If uh, you're writing like in a persuasive style, instead you might break down, yeah, did you use something like inclusive language? What register did you go for? Um, if you used first person in your piece intentionally, why have you done so? You can break down any characters, and this is the key focal point. You, ne you need to express your purpose, your message. So this is essentially your views and values. You're trying to dissect some views and values in your reflective commentary as well. <clears throat> Task criteria. Reflect on and share implications of authorial choices in your writing and the writings of others. So what are some of the authorial choices you made? What were your intentions with it? Explain and comment on vocabulary, text structures, language features, conventions, and ideas. Analyze, you choose evidence from your own piece to analyze, essentially an experiment with vocabulary. <clears throat> so this is a bit of a framework that you can use as a bit of a life hack, the flap C structure, abbreviated. In some way, shape, or form, these are the things that you have to address. <clears throat> the form, the text type that you've chosen, some of your main language choices, what your audience is, what your message is, and what is the context, audience purpose context, which is specifically required by Vika. So if you remember this, you'll always remember what you need to tick off. And it's got some useful question prompts to help you as well. What students like to do, um, if they're using a structure like this, <clears throat> is to put these elements in one paragraph. That's kind of like an introduction paragraph to their reflective commentary. It covers all of the main authorial choices. And then have a couple of mini paragraphs after this paragraph that are just looking at specific language choices and structural features and authorial choices and analyzing them. So this might be your first paragraph and then you, get, you have a couple of mini paragraphs that are like, yeah, that analyzing argument of your own work, you know, like quoting and analyzing some of your authorial decisions. Um, otherwise, you can just use the abbreviation to remember what needs to be in your reflective commentary. <clears throat> you should use a first person voice. 
but your piece should still be formal. So the, here are some sentence frames for you to use for reflective commentary. And we see an example. It's just a one paragraph example. So this wouldn't be the full thing. This imaginative short story, you know how it's following that flap C structure. It's introducing the form, the text type. It depicts a high school reunion, explores ideas of growing up, mental health, interpersonal relationships between young adults, all of which are themes present in the bell jar. So this introduces what the um, text is about, um, importantly. So that's how you should always start with. This is actually using that flap C structure perfectly so far. The theme of growing up connects the story to the framework of personal journeys as growing up is a metaphorical journey. It's introducing links to the framework of personal journeys. In the short story, I've reflected on the idea that growing up is a difficult process, explored how people change over time and expressed the confusion and uncertainty of early adulthood. So this is providing the purpose, the message in relation to the framework. Now we see some language choices. Recurring motive of Jan Janet's scrunched smile, you see it's been quoted implying that it's forced and disingenuous, conveys to the reader that the narrator feels somewhat unwel unwelcome and enhances his anxiety regarding how things have changed from adolescence to adulthood. So we see <clears throat> analyzing our own piece. <clears throat> and then a further analysis that's making more links to the audio, um, <clears throat> making more links to intended effect, and again, reiterating, extending upon the purpose, people can find solace in shared journeys, even when they involve negative feelings or experiences. So this is just a snippet, but we see even this little snippet covered form, already covering language choices, covering purpose, and need some audience and context as well, because your um, reflective commentary should aim to cover that also in some detail. All right, analyzing argument, final stretch very long section, we'll try to skim through it pretty quickly. So your process of analysis in analyzing argument is split into three stages, the what, how, and the why. And this is what you're doing in your body paragraphs. You're just doing the what, how, why process when you analyze. So it's usually a combination of what and how, and what and why when you analyze. You don't generally do all of it. Because how and why are different types of analysis. What is your evidence, your persuasive language technique? I'll call them PLTs from now because that's easier for me. It's your PLT named and quoted. And then for each piece of evidence, you choose whether to analyze the how, the intended effect upon the audience. Mentioning also is what the audience is. You shouldn't just say like, oh, the intended effect of this is... Um, or the why. How does it contribute to the author's argument or contention? How is this evidence convincing, essentially? So this is, these are the stages that you follow. The what, where you're aiming to answer what is the author doing, what language is being used, so quote and state the persuasive language technique. Embed this within your essay. For example, the author makes use of overtly negative language. So that's persuasive language technique is negative connotations such as terrible human being quote an example and then explain to establish with brown in an unfavorable light how is the intended effect not the actual effect so this is where you need to use your low modality verbs we talked about for example after we stated the evidence thus the author invites readers it's nice vocabulary for intended effect to consider how their support of brown might endorse his harmful behavior or through which the author seeks to engender a sense of fear amongst her readership of the misogynistic be behavior that Brown could inflict on, in Australia. <clears throat> so we're discussing intended effect. We need to use unbiased language. Here we see low modality put into practice and appropriate vocabulary. These are your definitive high modality phrases or just inappropriate and poorly worded. And these are examples you should be building a vocabulary bank for intended effect also. This is intended, this encourages, designed to elicit, evokes, um, <clears throat> aims to elicit, etc. <clears throat> so we see the process of analysis in practice. Let's just have a look at a couple. An example of the what, and these tables are really good practice to practice your analysis. Because um, this is what you do in 
in your essay, this is the bulk of your body paragraphs. This is all your evidence and analysis. If the what is describes the current election as looming over Australia to establish its immediacy, this intends to exacerbate existing anxieties amongst her readership on youth disengagement. See how that what and how it's so linked? Because specifically it's described as looming, its intended effect is it's exacerbating existing anxieties because that's the connotations of that word. An example of analyzing the why, how it contributes to the argument is, Lee suggests that with current levels of disengagement, the upcoming election is a threat or something to fear. <clears throat> Feel free to have a look at the other examples as well. So we said the why is about why does this support the author's argument? As such, the author creates a comprehensively ne negative image of Brown. How it contributes to the argument is that this furthers the idea that he should not be allowed into Australia. Or consequently, the author seeks to reduce the importance of Brown and other celebrities in the context of the entire views. It's how it contributes to the author's argument. Notice that you always need a link when you analyze the why. So if you said something, oh, this furthers the idea that you should not be allowed into Australia. How? How does it do that? By creating a comprehensively negative image of Brown. That needs to be part of your analysis. That needs to be there. Example. The author appeals to nostalgia in order to inspire audiences to support her contention. Why is that bad? It's so vague. What are we missing? How does the author appeal to nostalgia? If we're talking about a subtle persuasive language technique like an appeal, we need to talk about how the appeal is actually created. And how does nostalgia support her contention? So the what, let's break it down, is the appeal to nostalgia or nostalgic tone. The how, the intended effect, is it prompts us to reminisce the past happy memories. And the why, how it contributes to the argument, is it urges to preserve such memories. That's how it supports the author's contention. And then you do a table breakdown like that and you can put it all together. The author begins with a nostalgic tone, which is designed to prompt her audience to reminisce the past and picture the happy memories of their childhood at the local park. And we see the what has been done in the intended effect analysis, nice and specific. In doing so, signposting that we're going to go into how it contributes to the argument as well, she urges the community to see that in an attempt to preserve such memories, they should not demolish the local park. Um, so we can see <clears throat> that to get to the why, you always need to answer the question how. You know, in this case, because they're going to want to preserve those nostalgic memories of their childhood. That's why they're going to want to keep the park. <clears throat> so we see the what, how, why process in action. Remember what I said, you don't need to do all three stages every single time in a body paragraph. You might when the audience, the evidence is really significant, the PLT is really significant. Otherwise, for every piece of evidence that you pick to analyze, you'll generally only analyze either the how or the why, the intended effect or how it contributes to the argument. Another example, operating example, <clears throat> the author's imperative language as evidenced by his repeated use of the words must and need and see how nice and succinct it is that just naming the plt and incorporating the quotes and nice and short quotes creates a sense of urgency surrounding the public response to gang violence <laughs> introducing the intended effect and then again nice and succinct extends this encourages readers to support his call for decisive action in the form of stricter penalties for these those involved in violent acts and it's even using decisive action as a stylistic quote to help get to the point Nice and succinct. So aim with analyzing argument essays should always be this. Having a lot of evidence, being able to say a lot about it and all of those being unique ideas, trying to not, not to repeat the same ideas and the same analysis and having a high level, high amount of evidence analyzed relatively quickly and succinctly so you can move on and get, go into more and more and more. Um, it shouldn't be like a text response essay where you really need to stop and analyze in detail sometimes to show off it's more about like having lots of different ideas and a lot being able to analyze the progression of the argument and any changes in how that argument is constructed now visuals generally the exam is a two-page article with two images so any image that's included 
must be analyzed within a body paragraph. You must decide which argument it belongs to and analyze the visual, just like you analyze persuasive language cues. And there's a formula to do this. First of all, you need to find the length of when you're going to bring in the image. Okay? So, so usually that's chronological. <clears throat> the last evidence that, and the images that are put in pieces, they're always related to what the text is about. So when you're analyzing analyzing a PLT that's related to uh, what the image is about, after that, bring in your visual analysis into that body paragraph. And it's all in the same body paragraph where the argument is. So after analyzing some written element from the text, and you want to go into a visual, this is what you must do. First, describe what the visual is literally depicting. So introduce the type of visual. Is it a cartoon? Is it a caricature? Is it a photograph? Is it a painting? Okay, and state what you can literally see in the visual. Think background, foreground, any central objects or element. Then you just do the what, how, why process for the image. Find one to two significant things in the visual to analyze and just do the what, how, why process. After that, you can end the paragraph with a concluding sentence like you would, or you can go back to analyzing more written evidence in, uh, in that body paragraph if you feel like that's appropriate and that's what you want to do. <laughs> so visual elements as well, you should be using meta language and naming them appropriately. So even things like color and scale are uh, also considered, yeah, persuasive elements. <clears throat> this is a selective task. So, you know, you need to limit um, for section C when you're planning for the exam. Um, and this will be the first section that you do because this is where you must make use of your reading time. You should be planning in your head. So when writing time starts after the 15 minutes, you can start writing immediately, just reading this article and planning. And it's often the quickest to write for students. Um, most students, uh, 50 minutes and less for this task. And that's how they end up having a bit more time on the other sections. It's a shorter essay. But you need to plan your topic sentences in your head and which um, specifically elements are you going to choose to, to um, analyze, which PLTs, making sure you have enough subtle ones as well. And <clears throat> writing a contention uh, uh, for your introductions in analyzing arguments should cover all of these elements. A lot of students don't know how to write a good contention, but this is what a good contention should have. You can follow a bit of a format like this, the offer in a tone word plus li, so adjective plus the ending li, such as <clears throat> optimistically, contends that the issue, few short words that mention what the issue is, is, is it bad or good? And why, what is their main reason? that they disagree with or support this issue, and therefore, what do they want to be done instead? <clears throat> this is the format to follow. <clears throat> and this is how you'll plan. We've got a more detailed example later on, so I don't want to read through this, but <clears throat> when you're thinking about your contention and your introduction elements at the same time, these are the elements you need to plan first. Identify what's the issue, good or bad, why, What's the offer saying about pandemic loneliness? It's been long lasting and seemingly never ending. And what is the offer's goal? It's an advertisement for worry. Great, now you've got enough to write a contention. So then we implement all of the all of the five elements to create. Molly Roberts contends that the issue of pandemic loneliness is taking its toll on the populace. It's bad because it's taking its toll on people. As she suggests that it can be positively curbed by the sense of togetherness which activities such as Wordle foster. And we see all the elements of the contention has been um, included. Ultimately, this is what you're doing for your analyzing argument. How language, visual and written is used, how specific authorial choices shape meaning and argument, essentially that what, how, why process, so as to position the audience in a particular way for a particular reason. That's the what, how, why, in a nutshell. That's why I like that little framework. Now, remembering it's a bit less formulaic, so we looked at the contention in detail because that's the important thing. You need to write really nicely. But argument analysis intros need to include these elements. Context, what is the issue? The contention with all of the contention elements, the tone, 
the audience, which you also need to aim to specifically outline. And the purpose is, yeah, what does the offer want to be done? So, you know, if you do it like this, if you do the contention properly, you've already outlined the purpose of the piece. So <clears throat> when you introduce the context as well, not just introducing the issue, you need text type. An opinion piece is different from a blog post, so is a podcast trans transcript. Text type, offers full name, date of publication, place of publication, full title of the piece. And make sure to employ brackets to avoid jumbled, awful sentences. You can literally put brackets at the end of the sentence that has like the publication details and put the place of publication, comma, date of publication, close brackets. Um, so that way it's like not part of your sentence, but you have stated it. Body paragraphs. You need to have an argument. Usually the first argument tends to be around in an argument analysis piece around establishing what the issue is and why the issue is bad or good. The second argument will be something unpredictable is what the offer has come up with. And the third argument tends to be around a proposed solution or what the offer wants to be done instead or a call to action. So this is, if you keep this in mind, you'll find it much easier to write your topic sentences. Okay, see an example here. It is days very soon. Or is it? Is it a topic sentence? Yeah. It is Day's very suggestion of the power of ink that she urges readers of Street B to observe the significance of tattoos, namely for their symbols of pain and suffering. That's an example of a topic sentence that was done. If you want quotes, you can only use quotes for stylistic effect in your topic sentences, only without the intention not to analyze. Um, bring things back to the audience often and the context of the issue often. Assessors look for this. And you end with your concluding sentence are about your ultimate or for your intent or effect on the reader. So the ultimate how or the ultimate why for that entire topic sentence. Okay, possible intro introduction formula, you can follow this in order. Background information, what's the issue? Then introducing the text details, then your contention with the tone and with the purpose. And a final sentence outlining a specific target audience because your assessors do look for a specific target audience group. So try to give it its own sentence. A couple of questions to help you outline your audience. On the exam, it's always pretty easy because the exam, the section C's tend to be around like a made up community issue and the audience is specifically the community members. Some examples of subtle persuasive language techniques to analyze. Don't just use the basic ones, like rhetorical questions and evidence and statistics. Look for tonal shifts in particular. Um, and look for any appeals. When you talk about connotations, be more specific than saying negative or positive connotations. Negative connotations associated with what? Positive connotations associated with what? or depicting an image of quote from the piece where those connotations are seen. Let's go back to the visual analysis. What are some type features that we can analyze in the visual? Symbolism, size, facial expression, speech, speech bubbles, any juxtaposition, opposite, opposite things. Um, a specific link between visual and written text. There's a exhaust, exhaustive list, you know, to come up with. So having a look at an example, and let's look for connections to the text as well. It says, dig for victory, for their sake, grow your own vegetables. The community garden movement is, is no passing fashion. During the Second World War, everyone in Britain was urged to dig for victory by growing vegetables in every bit of spare land. Backwards and nature strips were dug up in the struggle to keep families fed. In the crisis of war, people suddenly understood how vulnerable a society is if we have forgotten or never learned how to produce our own food. We can see the text and the image are linked. Okay, find where are the links to the text, struggle to keep families fed. We see the families in the background. Vulnerable, for their sake. That text implies vulnerability. So then what are the features we might analyze? Their sake, which implies the vulnerability of these families and um, this society. These are the families which are the motivators for digging, but growing vegetables in every bit of spare land. 
Um, and this is the shoe on the shovel as well, which is our central object that we might want to analyze. So we've got background, text, and we've got the shoe, which is going to be a symbol, or you can refer to it as the central element. What can we gauge from these elements? For their sake, demonstrates the vulnerability of children and their reliance on others' contribution and hard work. We might analyze something along those lines and make that link to the text, to the struggle to keep their families fed. So they're the motivation for doing this, for abusing every bit of spare land and planting stuff. Um, patriotism, companionship, children are present, family values, right? The fact that we've got these kids in the background and they're smiling and they're happy. You can analyze the expression. And the boot on the shell signifies strength and hard work. It's a symbol of strength and hard work. So that's a visual analysis done. And then you choose what elements you want to put in your analysis of the visual. Um, so you can see the criteria here as well. But I already mentioned this. It's always like a two-page article in the exam. And it's only always two images. It tends to be. It has been over the last at least five, six years. So you can hope for something very similar to that. Um, essays shorter than other essays, so you need to practice doing it quickly. Why we're having this pretty early on as well in our lecture is because they've moved analyzing arguments so that you guys only do it at the end of the year now. So I don't feel like it's adequate exposure and preparation for the exam. And if I were you, I would be trying to practice analyzing argument constantly because you will not be confident doing it as a unit four area of study two. It's really late now, the new study design, so practice. Vocab list, vocab cheat sheet for all your um, authorial purpose for your um, analyzing argument. And again, the ones not to use, show says makes. Um, just don't use this for analytical writing. You can see these are analyzing argu argument specific vocab. <clears throat> Common mistakes in the area of study. Analysis focuses just on listing techniques. Another key thing that I see as well is <clears throat> sometimes students put uh, mention specific persuasive language techniques in their topic sentence. Big no-no. Topic sentence is the argument, is the idea. What is this argument about? What is the author trying to do? Okay. Um, you stick to the what, how, I process. You do that correctly. And look at those examples as well that have been given. You'll never um, end up just listing techniques and not analyzing. Empty analysis, that's just textbook phrases or definitions to describe the effects rather than injecting relevance and specificity. So sometimes what students often do is they follow that what, how, why process. But when they're analyzing, they just connect, oh, you know, if this is a rhetorical question, then they analyze basically what the general purpose or function of a rhetorical question is not specifically applying it to the text. So if you read your text, you should, first of all, you should read over it quite a few times before you even start writing and make sure like you're really understanding it, you're getting into the author's head. But also when you're following that what, how, why process and noticing all of the examples that I've shown, every intended effect analysis, every why analysis, how it contributes to the argument, brings everything back to stakeholders or specific audience members, or aspects of the issue that is mentioned in the piece. And that's how you make it specific and relevant. Good. To avoid all of these, link back every piece of evidence to argument and contention, and link back, link back to those specific elements. And your assessors are really looking for that. Are you analyzing in light of the context, the issue and the audience and other, any other relevant stakeholders? So, a good tip that I recommend, this is just some tips, close analysis exercise, just do a detailed plan, you know, plan of all of your intro elements, writing and contention, topic sentences, and the evidence that you use, and annotate the hell out of um, uh, an article. Really good and less time-consuming exercise. Because then when you actually write the body paragraphs, I feel like it's a bit easier with analyzing argument because it gets really repetitive. If you annotate like evidence on an article, you're basically doing the what, how, why, and you're basically writing the bulk of your essay, which is nice for students that don't like to write essays as much. Um, collect feedback, grow. This is a big section where vocabulary is important. If you can get away with 
not having big words in text response and creating text and you can't really get away with it in section C, you'll end up using so many of the same words and re re repetition when you're trying to analyze, especially for intended effect. You won't have tone words. You'll struggle to talk about intended effect. Um, you might be fence sitting or writing in an informal style and you might not have enough persuasive techniques under your belt. Okay, let's put it all into practice. So this is an example. As you're watching this, for the sake of timing, I, I really don't want to read this whole article. Please pause this and read the article. It's short. I want you to read the parts that are highlighted as well and think what technique is highlighted and why is this relevant and think about how you'd analyze in your head. This is an example that I made to show you how you put everything together, do a detailed plan. So please stop and read these bits and pieces. So as you can see in this piece, I tried to highlight any interesting word choices or persuasive language techniques that I might choose to analyze. Um, and I've sectioned the arguments. In this case, they were quite chronological. The first argument was introducing the issue. So we see that this was, I chose this to be the end of argument one. Then there's more text and this is argument two now. Again, please have a read for all of it because we're doing a detailed breakdown here. Um, and this is end of argument two with the image included and then argument three, which you can really see it's approaching and ending. Um, I'm sick of being made to feel guilty or inferior because I'm a meat eater. End of argument three. Okay, showing you guys how to do a plan. So this is an introduction plan. This is how I do it if I haven't done analyzing the ar argument in a while. The text type is an opinion piece. The tone is frustrated and critical. The author's name, publication details. Why going vago is a big mistake. Harold Sun, March 1st, 2019. Issue, try to detail your issue in, in a specific way, but not into too much detail as well. This one's a bit vague as well. So. It's got a bit of detail going on here. Meat-free burgers and other plant-based alternatives becoming increasingly popular. People with regular diets, meat eaters, suffering criticism as a result. The audience is meat eaters who feel threatened by the increasing popularity of alternative diets. Notice how nice and specific this audience is. This is what we need. Um, <clears throat> and feel that this will impose judgment or influence on their own diet. Contention, including all of our elements. O'Brien critically condemns that as a result of the surge of in popularity of vegetarian vegan food options, carnivores are losing the freedom to decide their own diets. She asserts that the community should promote eating meat rather than artificial meat substitutes as it is natural and poses less health risks to consumers. So we see tone word, contents, mentions the issue, indicates that it is bad, carnivores losing freedom. Issues bad and why? And then what does she want to be done instead? All have been outlined. And even the audience has been very specifically referred to, so you wouldn't really need an additional sentence to refer to it anymore. Reminding of the contention elements. I've put it together in a different way if it's easier for people to understand, because sometimes I like things to be dot points myself. <clears throat> and that shows each part of the contention highlighted, but I've just broken it down. And here's the introduction put together. In recent times, and you can use that sentence starter for any like modern issue because sometimes it's just feels a bit like odd to start in a nice way. It becomes might feel a bit tricky. In recent times, plant-based diets have become increasingly commended, and as a result, carnivores fall under harsh criticism. Introduce the issue. The author of the opinion piece, White Going Vego is a big mistake, published by the Herald Sun on March 1st, 2019, Susie O'Brien, suggests that meat eaters are being blamed for the environmental impacts, animal cruelty, and health impacts associated with the diet. Publication details are introduced here, but notice when you introduce publication details, you can't just end the sentence there. There's gonna be a second half to that sentence, otherwise it looks unfinished. So it's just gonna be an expansion upon your issue, or you can start already going to what your audience group is. O'Brien critically contends that as a result of a surge in popularity of vegetarian vegan food, meat eaters are losing the freedom to decide their own Diets. This has tone contention audience, and this expands on the contention with the proposed solution. This is the same sentence we um, read before. So you see how that's nice and short, but it's got every single element. It's a lot of introduction elements 
that we need to have in analyzing our argument. Next, when you're planning, plan your topic sentences. I gave you the helpful tip that often the first argument in analyzing argument pieces tends to be around introducing or establishing the issue of the piece. So topic sentence one, Brian introduced the audience to alternative diets, how they're increasing in popularity, posing a significant influence on food options available to carnivores. So know how I've even used introduces. <clears throat> so she's saying the issue is alternative diets, decreasing food options available to meat eaters. Topic sentence two, the author was suggesting that those leading plant-based diets are doing so for superficial reasons. They desperately crave meat, resulting in the unnecessary production of vegan-friendly replications. That's what she was saying. They can't help it. They want meat so bad. Um, the author concludes that artificial meat poses health risks, as it contains ingredients that are harmful to the human body. Thus, meat eaters should not be encouraged to change their diet. Okay, good. So if you read the piece, you should find that this is really consistent with what was the subject matter at the time that the article was talking about. And that's how you identify where an argument splits. You'll see a sudden change in topic matter. If she was talking about alternative diets, literally introducing the issue, you know, what is what are alternative diets? That's what she was talking about. What new food options have come out? And all of a sudden she's talking about how, oh, uh, they wish they could eat like hamburgers and cheeseburgers and stuff. And there was a tonal shift as well. That indicated to me that it's splitting into the next argument. And <clears throat> when they start <laughs> with the third one, <clears throat> I think the third one is always the easiest because there's always some kind of proposed solution or associated call to action associated with that. And this was it. She said, meat eaters are superior. They shouldn't change their diet for anything. So then plan all of your evidence. For topic sentence one, we're thinking play on words, mistake and a big mistake. If you're doing a detailed plan, dot point your analysis. So <clears throat> this, this, this is in the title, this play on words, right? So what does it do? <clears throat> Incorporates humor, the enticing imagery, note the meta language use of a steak to appeal to her audience of meat lovers and establish she's opposed to plant-based diets from the outside of the piece. She's on the other side of the issue. Rhetorical questions, wait, what? Flexitarian aims to discredit the flexitarian diet because these people do consume meat occasionally. She's used an analogy, look how like, Going out of my way to find some subtle persuasive techniques, like the play on words in the title in an analogy. To paraphrase Austin Powers, they are the diet coke of vegetarians. So that's subtle because it's a bit difficult to analyze. What do we think that means? Although vegetarians expected to choose healthy food options, they'll in, un, indulge in unhealthy and artificial foods such as diet coke. Um, so that's discrediting their diet. Excluding language creates an in-group of the meat lovers and an out-group. So that's analysis that brings things back to the issue, bring, bring things back to the audience. You know how all of the analysis tries to do that in some way, shape or form. Bring back to details about the issue to the stakeholders involved. <clears throat> and then visual analysis. Remember what we talked about again in dot point structure. We see the grilled founder in this image. So first we need to plan what is the visual really literally depicting the CEO grilled, Simon Crow, Positioned with a plant-based grilled burger, and then what would we potentially analyze? His expression? He's got a bit of an exaggerated forced smile. We could plan that analysis. O'Brien uses his unnatural expression to demonstrate how much marketing and advertising was invested into grilled many chain, suggesting it is the popularity and potential financial gain from selling plant-based alternatives propelling the chain change rather than the actual quality or taste of the burger. Might seem like a bit of a far stretch, right? But it can be surmised because of his position as a CEO and because of the large amount of marketing that was invested. So as a student, your job is to, yeah, do come up with some a bit more far-fetched ideas, as long as they make sense in your argument analysis. And that's what it's going to, your assessors will love it. Your examiners will really like it. Um, grilled burger, you can also analyze the burger itself. It looks cold, lacks color. Another technique so expression is a visual technique and then color the notion that plant-based alternatives are not appealing and do not taste good and then we put all of this together feel free to pause and have a read but it's the same features we had planned so you can see now how you can gauge the task doing detailed plans first initially 
um, to try to get really good at analyzing your argument. Okay. Um, you can have a look. I've, the, I've done the same. I've attached the same for a body paragraph two and a body paragraph three. Notice I'm limiting myself to how much evidence I'll put in a paragraph as well, because you need relevance. Yes, there is a lot of text to work with, but you can only select so many persuasive language techniques. <clears throat> Another visual analysis example and a body paragraph three. So final tips for in questions for English. First of all, annotating text. Um, really important. I want you to annotate your books. If you've got a film, get your script out and annotate. Um, annotating helps you to analyze. So oftentimes students will complain they do like a plot retell a lot and they get feedback for that, but they don't really practice analyzing. Quickest way to do that is annotate as you read. Annotate why things are significant. It's a skill you need to practice. We talked about some techniques for avoiding summary, but this is a specific way to practice that skill. Um, things that you can look for for your annotations. Um, important moments of plot vocab you don't understand. In fact, um, you should have big banks of evidence for your text organized by, organize your quotes by themes, ideas, characters. You should also have a structural features section. And I would also have a separate section where um, I just have like these, some views and values ideas, some key views and values ideas uh, from my text as well that I think are really nice. So what I used to do is make this for my text. I used to have big word documents that would just have organized quotes by themes, characters, ideas. If there's something, if there's film techniques, I'd have a section on film techniques. If there's a lot of symbolism, I'd have a section on symbolism. And I dot point very succinctly, don't overwrite because you'll never actually end up using your resource, dot point very succinctly your analytical ideas. <clears throat> we talked about analyzing versus summary, so that's just a little bit of a revision. And final tips for practice essays, work on your weaknesses. Don't stay away from things that you're not good at because this is the only way you'll get better at the subject. Very, very important. So if timing is your issue, only write in time conditions. You can try practicing typing an essay with the same limit first, and then you try to slowly get yourself to the point where you don't even let yourself type it anymore. Now you have to handwrite it um, with the same time limit. Work on your weaknesses. Write, the write on the things that you struggle with. So if you struggle with topic sentences, do more essay plans, write topic sentences. If you struggle with evidence, go back to your text and work on that. You know, if um, if essays take a long time, valid. I used to find that essay, essays take such a long time too. So I would write a body paragraph as practice, you know, and that's fine. Or do like a detailed plan. You don't have to always write essays. Work on your weaknesses. It's a bunch of ideas of things that you can do. Um, and some fun, fun things like, struggling to feel inspired about your text or understand your text you can go and like read some critical analyses you can find some great ones on google scholar like for a lot of texts as well of your text and you can you can take their analytical ideas as well you can use them to substantiate your own interpretations um <clears throat> but importantly get a lot of feedback on your work and when you identify areas of weakness actually write them down pl make a plan a physical plan of how you're going to fix them and work towards writing, getting better at writing. Okay, thanks.